Welcome to Kujanga. We are your hosts, Shaba Kojo. Loon Ajua. Jermaine. And what are we discussing today, Loon? So answer this for me, Kujanga. How much energy should we allocate to history in our nation building process? I think history is important and it isn't important. So it has kind of this double consciousness, if you will. History, I think, is important for us as a people to know that we have a rich history, that we're more than just what happened when we came here um, from slavery, at least in America. Um, we're more than just a, a couple of pyramids in Egypt. Um, we have a rich history throughout Kebalan, and that it should inform uh, you know, our confidence as a people um, as we move forward. However, there are a lot of things that are happening now that I don't see any precedent for in history that I think we're going to have to use the principles that, that we are aligning ourselves with that we discussed previous, in previous episodes. But I think we're going to have to come up with some, up with some new ways of thinking um, and some creativity in, in terms of survival moving forward. And I, I don't think history it will be able to help us in that kind of in what's happening now in modern times, especially with the advent of technology and a lot of different things that are occurring at, at, at uh, a fast pace. I mean, history, what can history tell us about how to deal with social media or artificial intelligence or any other number of things that our ancestors never had to deal with? I want to agree with you, Jay, because honestly, there's so much of our ancient culture that I don't think is relevant to what we're dealing with nowadays. Uh, it's interesting to know, you know, to have that information, but not so insightful, I don't think, when dealing with other races' attempt to reign supreme over us. What's your input? I think history is extremely important. In this conversation, like, I'm going to be that dissenting voice. It's always relevant. And I'm speaking on it from first hearing and trying to internalize Dr. John Henry Clark's definition, that history is that clock. It tells us our political time of day. It tells us where we are, but more importantly, it tells us where we're going and what we're going to need to be. So history is the lens by which we can anticipate thematic behavior, if you will. Go ahead, Jay. What kind of history are you talking about, though? Let's go, go back to fundamentals here. So are we talking about event kind of history where, all right, this person was ruler of this area or these people who existed during this time? Are we talking more about a history of our, our foundational principles in terms of values? It's, that's different, right? Like, I don't think anything in history from a specific event or uh, any kind of thematic history, like narrative history, is going to help you with CRISPR and DNA splicing. But I think the values that we've created and customs that we've had over the centuries can help in informing our decisions moving forward when we deal with these, these specific problems. I don't know if that's what you're saying. So you were saying that we learned from our ancestor, John Henry Clark, that history is to inform us where we're going. So based on that, where do you believe we're going? I believe that as al Kebalan people, we're stuck in a loop. So is history helping us right now? History is not helping us because we are not studying it. And when we get close to studying our history and behaving like our historical selves, that's when we recognize that outside pressures increase against us. That's when our political leaders who are leading us in the direction back to our history and our natural selves are literally assassinated. So how is history beneficial? Whatever it is that we were doing at the time when we started our downfall is a look back in history going to help us to identify and correct it for what purpose are we looking back so take for instance the 60s the black power movement as some have coined it and even some of that day would coin it as well and i'm speaking specifically about the black panther party i'm speaking specifically about at the time stokely carmichael fred hampton H. Rap Brown, and of course the founders of the Black Panther Party, that would be your, your Huey P. Newtons. They were informing us of the same information 
that none other than Marcus Garvey had began to inform us of when he was attacked, when he was shot, when he was put on trial, when he was arrested, when he was deported, when he was literally driven away from his sane mind. And they were trying to get us back to that because when we saw what happened to Marcus Garvey, we changed tactic. We changed direction of Pan-Africanism, if you will. So I don't believe it It was until we got back to the Black Panther Party that America's consciousness of Al-Kebulon and Al-Kebulon descendants began to shift back to Pan-Africanism, began to shift back to Garvey and Nkrumah and looking back towards the continent of Africa, of looking back towards our natural hair, of our natural behavior, of understanding our natural enemy in that of the European mindset of capitalism and colonialism and imperialism. Right. So it was history trying to teach us again, hey, don't forget these lessons. And of course, those lessons would have been known already from the people who informed Garvey, who were, again, historical figures. So it's when we begin to get closer to our history and begin to say, let's start to take some lessons from what our history teaches us. Let's start to behave in a way in which History demands that we, if you will, separate ideologies from the colonial or imperialistic mindsets, that we are at our most endangered points, because that's when investigations and underhanded tactics begin to be used against us, as opposed to just outright bigotry. I feel like I'm asking the same question in a different way. Did we learn those lessons? I don't feel like our parents' generation positioned us in an informed way to have learned the lessons of their day that was being taught by the Black Panthers that the Black Panthers learned from Garvey. And so for that, I feel like history has not served us. Yes, we learned the lessons and then we got a spanking and then we were told to forget about that mumbo jumbo. But I believe that a learned lesson is a lesson that you come out of, not necessarily on top, but better informed and perhaps have advanced some steps in the direction where you want to go. But I don't feel like we're any closer to our ideals, where, where we want to be in this world having gone through the 60s and the 70s. I think that we're trying to recover. I'm thinking more from a tactical perspective. I mean, just just think about the disinformation that's happening on social media, right? You know, you have pe- people who act like they're you know, Kebalon people, and they're trying to influence us, you know, bad actors, basically, from other countries or whatever. So are you speaking about Russia in the last election? Is that what we're, we're, we're talking about? Are we talking about the disinformation campaign that Russia was putting to separate al Kebilan or African people? Not, not just Russia. I'm, I'm just saying anybody can do it. Basically, my point is there, there are factors and environmental factors that are historically we've never had to deal with. I don't think there's a blueprint for that. No matter what values we have, there's no, there's no blueprint for what's coming. We're not prepared for it. And I don't think looking back to know what happened during any of the periods from the Black Panther Party to the Harlem Renaissance, I don't think any of those periods will, can help us right now. I have a different relationship to history than that. And maybe that has to do with the amount of time in my day I spend what some people would call being stuck in the past. My understanding of history is like that of a proverb. Can a zebra change its stripes? That is a history lesson. That's a history lesson that was taught from generation to generation to generation to generation until it became a proverb, until they found out a very simple way to say it. So in my estimation, all of our proverbs that come from the continent are nothing more than history lessons that have been simplified. So we call them proverbs or wisdom sayings because we wish to put an entire lesson complete with build up drama, something to be learned, something to be avoided. And we wish to summarize that into one sentence. Can a zebra change its stripes? And I chose that particular proverb because as we're moving forward and we're still dealing with how to establish ourselves or how to reestablish ourselves politically, we have to understand the zebras, if you will, that are 
historically against our march forward. And we have to look at it from a proverbial standpoint and say, well, the zebras that are in front of us right now, whether they be liberal, whether they be conservative, whether they be ultra liberal, ultra conservative, when it really comes down to it, are they going to give us the tools that we need in order to be independent and stand strong on our own juxtaposed to their power? And the answer is in the proverb, can a zebra change its stripes? And that's a history lesson. So now that you're speaking about, well, CRISPR and technological advancements, in my estimation, high science, high technology, those things had their birthplace, particularly in our high civilization in Kemet, their papyri with all those kinds of formulas and things on them that were never credited to us, that are in the back of the book called Civilization or Barbarism. Those formulas are still being used in mathematics today as we're moving into mapping the human genome. Well, that's done, though. That's completely done. We were pretty much mapping the brain probably within the next decade. We know exactly what each part of the brain is going to do. That's not a mathematical formula. That's the es essence of life. That's a reality. So as other people are mapping the mind, we're trying to figure out, you know, what happened. Who Martin Luther King is and Carl G. Woodson is. I'm sorry. <laughs> so is, is that our relationship to history? Is our relationship to history what happened in the 1900s? No, no I'm, I'm even going further back to a germane statement you know we're more than a couple of pyramids as far as i know it's like several hundred pyramids uh, but is that what we're going to base ourselves on when are we going to say and is it right for us to say well that was that this happened and we're here now we we have these circumstances and how can we move forward and not get left behind to me history is a shortcut to that because history says if we were following our history, if we were following our stories, which we have forgotten, which we have forgotten that we had forgotten, our stories told us a long time ago before they mapped the human genome that everyone came from Africa. Mm -hmm. And now science is catching up to that realization. Mm -hmm. So there is wisdom stored in our history that we refuse to look at. And we say we're going to use science and technology to prove things that the Dogons have been saying forever. The Dogons spoke of the star system Sirius and Sirius B before science was able to build a telescope to prove what they've been saying all along. Is that history? Is that what we're talking about? Yes. What I'm saying is we need to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. And I think walking is, let's say, the, the history and chewing gum is the other stuff. And I think we need to chew more gum than walk right now. The analogy, the analogy <laughs> kind of threw me off, though, Jay. The analogy, the analogy threw me off. So if I'm hearing you right, to sit in front of the books or the computers and research historical figures like Garvey and W.E.B. Du Bois and Nkrumah and Clark, Clark and, and I wanted to say one more, Booker T. Washington. Go back way before that, the time of Ramses and Tutankhamen, I mean, Nubians, all that stuff. I'm not saying it's not important, but I'm saying is that takes a lot of time for all of us. One of the problems that we have right now is that we assume that people know who even the, the rudimentary figures are. We, they, a lot of people still don't know who those people are. It takes a lot of time to get not just the people that we are in line with, but also the masses to understand and intricacies of those particular times. Do we have the time for that? I can tell you fully qualified, we do not have the time for that. So where should we be putting our time? We should have what Malcolm X had. He had a history department. And every speech, every lecture, every debate that Malcolm X got into, that research was done by his history department. His history department was partly led by Dr. John Henry Clark, who we all know was a pillar of history in our community during the time of Malcolm X. And Malcolm X would not have been such a powerful spokesperson for the nation of Islam or for us as the black nation in America if he did not have that history department. So does everyone have the time to sit back and learn the history? Absolutely not. But which civilization ever put that burden all on one person? Because even as 
Alexander the Macedonian went in to conquer Kemet. He, he wasn't the philosopher. He wasn't the scribe. He brought those people with him. He brought Aristotle with him. Aristotle was his librarian and history teacher. And we have somehow gotten to the point now where we don't think we need to move as those those fortified units. We think that each individual needs to learn the history lesson or the all the history lessons. Not at all. I think some people need to absolutely dedicate themselves to learn in history. I, I, I'm being one of those people. So I know that my contribution to my people is going to be in the department of how do I get all of that information that our ancestors have gotten before us, repurpose it, rebrand it, simplify it for this generation, who is the YouTube generation and the Wikipedia generation and the Facebook generation? How do we bring that back onto a new platform? And this isn't new to me because I'm learning from folks like Saneda and, and, and those guys of how to bring all that information back. But without a Saneda who went back in history and got all those recordings... I would have never found out about John Henry Clark. I would have never been put on this path that I'm on. So for you, Jay, that's heavy into technology and heavy into security. That's not your route. But if you have a, a, a trusted ally who is dedicated to history, then we can communicate. I'm not I'm certainly not going to go and dedicate time to learn in security right now. I've gone too far in a different direction. Uh, my my dedication to my people is history, philosophy, and the the rudiments of, of 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 African spirituality, so that I can reintroduce people to it without being so far disconnected and so deep into it that I feel like I'm ahead of the curve. So I need to feel like right where I'm at, so I can introduce them to history, philosophy, and African spirituality. I will go with you there. However, in practice, what we're doing is we're just as you said, you're teaching these. Uh, you have students and stuff, you're teaching them a, a history. In turn, you're basically saying that each one of us has to have some sort of baseline. Not necessarily we need to have a history department, but each one has a baseline. So how much of that baseline do we need to have? Mm. We need to have the same amount of baseline we need to interact with technology. That could be a high bar. Absolutely. So we take for granted just how far along our generations are when it comes to interacting with technology. And then we look at our grandparents who say, I, I don't know what that is. Get that computer phone out of my face. The phone with the camera, the camera phone and the thing. And there are people still covering their cameras with with stickies and and things like that. And people are, uh, as my NSA. best friend Terry would say, are Luddites. Mm -hmm. But what do we know about Luddites at this particular moment in time, that they better have children that understand technology. So that's why we get that phone call from grandma or if we have some parents that are getting older along from mom and dad that say, son, daughter, I need you to do this for me on the inter thingy. And then we've got to translate that language and do for them things on the inter thingy that benefit them. Because they're obviously got left behind in the technology generation and it's necessary in their lives. History to me is the reverse of that. We have people that have all the technology in the world and no cultural compass. So any media that their brains digest, they think it's good for all people. So that's why we end up with teenage black children living in urban communities, as they call them. But history teaches us that it ain't nothing but the ghetto that are being over policed. And some of them still have the opinion. Well, if they just listen, then they wouldn't have gotten hurt. Well, that's not what history tells us. If they understood history, they would understand really why they're in the situation that they're in. And yes, it can be simplified that, well, if the person didn't get upset, if the victim of the police overreach didn't get upset, then they wouldn't have gotten beaten up. Then they wouldn't have gotten harmed if they had followed directions. But they should know that statistically, they're in a situation on purpose based on historical buildup that put them in that position to have a higher interaction and a higher chance of having negative outcomes with the police. And it's only history that can teach that. So again, what's the baseline for your typical Ekebelon, what should be the baseline for them in terms of his history? That's 
make this even more specific, the cable lines in America, what should their baseline be? I mean, do we want to just limit it to a cable line in America or a cable line um, globally? There's different contexts, right? Yeah, there's different cultural contexts. Wherever you are, if you are a cable line in this world, that you should, there should be a certain understanding. Because even in our walk now, as we come into knowledge of our history, we come across a cable line that are from the continent that have no understanding of our plight, that they didn't even know about slavery. It wasn't taught to them on the continent. Correct. Or the Aborigine in Australia will have a different experience. Right. That I honestly don't know too much about. And they're my people as well. And I should have an understanding of what they're enduring. And from there, be able to learn real time and have a better understanding of the forces that work against us worldwide. Because it's not it maybe slightly tweaked tactics. But overall, it's basically the same agenda. That's what I've actually been dedicating my time to. I wouldn't call it what you called it, Jermaine, which is the baseline. But I would call it what one of my teacher calls it, the al Kebalan narrative. I would call it what Mama Marimba Ani calls it, the African worldview. We need to teach people of al Kebalan descent the al Kebalan narrative, the African worldview. Once you begin to teach that, then they can begin to decide exactly how deep they want to go down the Department of History. And even if they decide to go into other departments of human studies and human necessities, they can at least view it through the lens of how does this benefit African people or how can I work in this position to Lighten the burden or remove the harm from African people, because not all things that you do in areas of people activity were designed to benefit African people. And some were flat out designed to harm African people. That's why in every system of people activity, the outcomes remain that if you are white, you have better outcomes and interactions with systems of people activity. And if you are black, you have reduced, subdued, straight up, oftentimes negative outcomes in the same systems that were meant to benefit people. And that all comes from a historical context. So how much they need to know to me is not as important as understanding that there is a completely different worldview that is not wrong and that fits your genetic coding. And we were, to we were told to put away that worldview because just like this conversation states, the world is moving on. So therefore, we have to join the march of universal man. We have to join the march of objectivity. We have to join the march of objectifying and finding the object, the one thing in the system that you can isolate from everything else. And we need to stop looking at the world like that. We need to start looking at the world like the entire planet is connected. The entire planet, people, systems, uh, environments, ecosystems, the African worldview says all of those things are connected. And if we start to look at it through that worldview, through that African worldview, then we can begin to change how these systems that were created by men are operating so that they can start to operate in our benefit. So not so much how much, but how we need to behave with information that we receive. Yeah, but I think you need more than just the worldview because you need the worldview in tandem with uh, the contextualization of the worldview in specific events, specific historical events, specific historical times, and that type of stuff. That's what takes the time because you can just do the worldview, but then you need to correlate that to chattel slavery, you need to correlate that to the Civil Rights Act, you need to correlate that to colonialism and carving up of Africa. I mean, you need to tie it to all those things. I don't think you can just, just have that worldview in, in isolation. <laughs>